Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. All right, well, good morning, Wildwood, and happy Palm Sunday to you this morning. I don't know if you know much about Palm Sunday. It's not, it's not something that gets a whole lot of attention here at Wildwood. It's not a major tradition of ours, but uh, we love to, uh, to bring kids onto the stage uh, most Palm Sundays. Um, and, you know, each, each gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus, what we call Palm Sunday, uh, on this day of his Passion Week. Uh, I'm particularly drawn to the Gospel of John, and in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, uh, we, we read the narrative of Palm Sunday, and, uh, or the triumphal entry. And you know, for many of us, if you've grown up in a church that really celebrates, makes a, a big deal of Palm Sunday, maybe you, you have left with a palm branch. Have, have you ever done that in the shape of a cross, maybe? Uh, that's kind of a traditional way of, of observing Palm Sunday. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any of those, uh, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> we don't have any of those. But Palm Sunday is called Palm Sunday because on that Sunday, Jesus entered into Jerusalem riding on a donkey's colt and, and, and to much fanfare. Uh, great crowds of people gathered around him shouting out, Hosanna, which means save now, liberate us, uh, save us. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, and, and they laid down palm branches and their cloaks, their outer garments, uh, on the road for Jesus to enter. It was a kingly welcome. So Palm Sunday was all about these, these massive crowds uh, welcoming Jesus. But we are here, we exist, the church exists because it didn't stay that way very long. In fact, Palm Sunday didn't even end with belief. It began with shouts of Hosanna. It began with shouts of, of liberation, of, of save us. Our king has come to, to liberate us from Rome. And immediately Jesus begins to rebuke. If you, if you refresh yourself of, of the, the four gospels, the, the narratives of the triumphal entry, you see he cleansed the temple. He, he goes into uh, the religious center, the temple, where they have made a mockery of this, and now it's this place of for profit, uh, of cheap sacrifice, and he turns over the, the tables, the money counters, uh, those that are exchanging currency. He, he rebukes the crowd. Uh, John records that this great crowd had gathered around him because they heard that he raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus was a spectacle. And they, and they gathered to see the show. And Jesus said things like the Son of Man must be lifted up. And they said, yes, but, but Messiah is supposed to last forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? You see, there's this lack of belief. And Jesus rebukes them, corrects them, speaks to them. He doesn't withhold the truth. He, doesn't, he, does, he, he refuses to become the Messiah that they desired in order to become the Messiah that they needed or to be the Messiah that they needed. But so few in the crowd believed. John narrates the scene like this in John chapter 12, verses 30 through 37 through 40. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. What began on Palm Sunday with celebration ended in unbelief 
and harden hearts. And unfortunately, in the following decades, not much change for Israel. And Paul, in our passage today, in Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 10, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, 7 through 10, sheds light on the unbelief of Israel that was marked so clearly on this day in the Passion Week of Christ, Palm Sunday, and endured and still endures today. So let's read here in Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. Paul says, What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you on a day that, that was characterized by celebration, by shouts of Hosanna, but that is muffled by the truth that would be expounded over the following days. And what began with Hosanna ended with crucify him. And so, Lord, we, 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 cannot, we cannot deny the tragedy of hard hearts that lead to unbelief. And, Lord, we face that even today. I pray, Lord, that you would soften hearts and give eyes to see and ears to hear that we might understand and believe. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul says, what then? In other words, what, how, what do we make of all this? What's the conclusion? Uh, after all that I've just laid out in, 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 in chapters nine and 10, what then? Here's the conclusion. Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. God's righteousness is given by grace, but Israel was seeking to establish their own righteousness by works. Thus Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. That's not the way it works. It's not a right path, it's not the right way. You know, I think about it like it, 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 they were trying to buy the ticket with monopoly money. It doesn't work that way. Grace or, or, or righteousness with God, right standing with God is a gift of grace, not works. Israel's trying to make their own way, their own righteousness by works, and they failed to obtain what they were seeking. Paul continues, the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. The elect, the, whom, whom Paul referred to in verse five as the remnant chosen by grace, the elect, the elect have obtained the righteousness of God. Why? Because we worked so hard to get it? Because they were such great people? They were so virtuous? They were, they were more virtuous than the most virtuous Jews? No, they obtained it because it was a gift by grace or of grace. It was imputed to them through faith, not works. They were chosen by grace not because of any virtue, not because of any works on their part. Why? Uh, you know, why did God do it this way? Well, Paul, Paul sheds light on that in Ephesians 2 when he says, lest anyone should boast. You know, salvation is by grace through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. What, what are we prone to do? We are so prone to boast in our achievements. If you and I had earned our salvation, in fact, this is what Paul reveals to us in Philippians 2, he says, all these things that I counted as, as precious to me, I now count as garbage. The, the, the things that I have to boast in, my heritage, my education, my background, all of these things I count as garbage now because of Christ. 
But before Christ, what did he do? He boasted. So why did God do it this way? That, that, that salvation, that right standing with him is a gift of grace so that you don't boast because God is supremely about his glory. And so he says, you know what? You can't earn this. I'm simply going to give it and I'm gonna get the glory. The elect of God recognize that they've obtained what they have because of grace. That's why we sing worship to God. That's why we praise the Lord. Who is like the Lord? The Lord is my salvation. Not my good works. Not I'm, I'm a good church attender or a member. I'm, I, not I'm a good person. But rather the Lord is my salvation. God gets the glory. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, Paul said. The rest were hardened. Now this reminds me of Romans chapter nine, where Paul quotes from Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. The context is, is Moses and Pharaoh, and God is speaking to Moses. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Why? Because I'm God. Because I can, because that's who I am. I created you. I created the world. I'm sovereign. I'm supreme. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion, and, and everyone else gets justice. No one gets injustice. You get mercy or justice with God. A few verses later in, in Romans 9, 18, he says, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Now this may evoke in you a desire to, to rebut, to say that's not fair. And I would remind you of, of, of Paul's caution when he says, but who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? You know, whenever, whenever you and I come to a trouble passage or a verse that feels hard to understand, the rest were hardened. The elect obtained it, the rest were hardened. We might think, God, that, that doesn't seem fair. What we need to do is take a little dose of humility and say, it is you and I who lack understanding, not God who lacks injustice. Whenever we can't make our understanding meet with the justice of God, when it doesn't make sense to us, we need to recognize you and I are the ones that are unable to comprehend things as they really are. This is called humility. When, when we stand in judgment of God, that was the theme of, of Romans chapter nine, the, the, that, that man would stand in judgment of God and say, God, your ways are wrong. No, Paul says how unsearchable are his judgments. At the end of this chapter and at the end of this section in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, here's kind of the final word as it relates to God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Whenever you find yourself starting to uh, condemn God or judge God or, or think, well, that's not fair, you need to remind yourself his ways are inscrutable. Your thoughts are not. Amen. Amen? Th this is a major dose of humble pie. Romans 9 through 11. If you recall the context of, of Exodus chapter 33, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did. And God said that I, I hardened Pharaoh's heart. However, that hardening came after Pharaoh hardened his own heart five times. Five times Pharaoh, it is recorded that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He saw the signs, he saw the wonders, and then he hardened his heart. And then finally, we read that God hardened his heart. Likewise, Paul has painstakingly made the case that Israel has hardened its heart. 
by seeking to establish their own righteousness, by failing to submit to the righteousness of God, by being disobedient and contrary to God. All day long, I've held out my hand to a disobedient and contrary people, God says. And by stumbling over the rock of offense, you know, which is a really sterile way of saying they crucified the Son of God. Lest we ever uh, forget the wickedness of man's heart. The very people who, who shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest were raising their voices five days later, crucify him, crucify him. Given the opportunity to release this man, they chose instead a murderer. Give us Barabbas instead and crucify him. They stumbled over the rock of offense. So undeniably, God hardened them. The rest were hardened, Paul says. God hardened them, rendering them even more insensitive to the Holy Spirit and sealing their unbelief. But we read this only after we read multiple times of Israel hardening their own hearts. In verse 8, Paul says, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. So here Paul quotes two verses, one from Isaiah and one from Deuteronomy. You know, it's really hard to deny what Paul is saying here. Someone might say, well, you know, the rest were hardened. Well, Paul doesn't tell us who exactly hardened their hearts, although whenever Paul writes in the passive, it is almost always a divine passive. The rest were hardened by God. Well, we can't deny that here. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. A spirit of stupor is a mind that fails to understand. It's, it, 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 it is like a deep sleep. That's the, that's the actual phraseology in the Isaiah verse. But Paul quotes from both Deuteronomy and Isaiah, and it's interesting here because in the law, some, no one would be pronounced guilty unless two or three witnesses agreed. And here Paul appeals to two witnesses. And this is actually something that you can find throughout Romans 9 through 11, this appealing to two witnesses from Scripture. Deuteronomy represents the law and Isaiah the prophets, two witnesses from the Word of God testifying about Israel's apostasy. Interestingly, the actual verse that Paul quotes in Deuteronomy says, but to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. Now the context there, this is Moses speaking to the people of Israel after the 40 years of wandering. After the manna from heaven, the, the, the quail, the water from the rock, after we read that their clothing did not wear out, for 40 years in the wilderness, their clothing did not wear out. And in spite of all of these things, we read, Moses tells the people that they still don't get it. Despite seeing all that God has done, despite observing firsthand the miracles, the deliverance out of Egypt, the deliverance from Pharaoh, the mighty miracles, the, the, the pillar of flame at night, the pillar of cloud by day, they still don't get it. Paul says God gave them a spirit of stupor. That is a quote from Isaiah 29. Here's the actual verse. For the Lord has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and covered your heads, the seers. In 1 Samuel, we read that prophets and seers are the same thing, that, that prophets of that day were at one point called seers. So, so God sent prophet after prophet who called the nation of Israel to faithfulness and repentance. And what did they do to them? They killed the prophets. 
They, they, it's like they, they closed their eyes and they, they put their hands over their ears. They didn't want to hear. They didn't want to see. They didn't want to receive the message. They killed the messengers because they rejected the message. Over and over again, God sent his people, these prophets, with a clear message, return to me, come back to me, repent of your sin. You, you, have, you have forsaken me, but I have not forsaken you. In Luke 10, Jesus helps us understand what they should have seen. They, they, they couldn't see it, they failed to see it. And in Luke chapter 10, we see, or we, we understand from Jesus' words what they should have seen. In Luke chapter 10, verse 23 and 24, we read, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Jacob, can you, you got Luke chapter 10? Here we go. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The context is, is Jesus had sent his disciples out, 72 disciples, two by two, into these villages on a short-term mission trip. And they've returned the way most of us return from short-term mission trips, on a high. And they're rejoicing, and they cannot believe, they're marveling that even demons submit to us in your name, Jesus. That's what they come back saying. Even demons submit to us in your name. And they're marveling at this, and Jesus rejoices over this, but Luke records that he's not so much rejoicing that demons submit to their name, or to his name, but rather that their names, the names of his disciples, are written in heaven. In other words, I recognize, Jesus is, is looking at his disciples, I recognize that you men see clearly. Your names have been written in heaven. You are, sa you are saved. You see as you ought to see. He says, I thank, my, I thank you, Father. He prays here in Luke chapter 10. Before he said that about blessed are the eyes that see what you see, here's what he says. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then he says, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So, so what should Israel have seen? They should have seen Jesus as Messiah. They should have seen Jesus the way the Father sees Jesus, the way he really is. See, see on Palm Sunday, we, we get the sense, the very clear sense of how they saw Jesus, of what they, of what they made Jesus to be in their own minds. Political rescue, immediate salvation. But what Jesus came to bring was ultimate salvation and eternal rescue. What should they have heard? They should have heard the gospel. They should have heard the, the message that went first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. By the time that Paul is writing this, the gospel has already gone to the Jews. It's already gone to Jerusalem. By this time, there are tens of thousands of Jewish believers calling upon the name of Jesus, believing the gospel, repenting of their sin, being saved, and yet so few, that represents so few of the Israelites. And Paul is helping us to understand why so few. Why did most of the Jews reject their Messiah? They would not see Jesus as he is, and they would not hear the gospel of their salvation. They could have been saved. 
But to do so, they would have had to go to the father as a little child. The elite and the educated and the virtuous were too good for grace. What a pity. And tragically, their judgment was prophesied a thousand years before. We read here in verses 9 and 10, and David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So this, this quote of David, again, about a thousand years before Christ, this, this psalm is Psalm 69, verses 22 and 23. Psalm 69 is a prophetic psalm. It's a messianic psalm. It, it, is, it is a psalm that, that certainly meant something to David. David wasn't speaking, you know, uh, meaningless words. They meant something to him, but they find the ultimate fulfillment in the Christ. And Paul is indicating to us that ultimately this psalm, Psalm 69, was fulfilled in the Jews who rejected Jesus. You know, in speaking of why the Jews hated him so much, Jesus quoted from Psalm 69, 4. And he says this in John 15, 25. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Psalm 69, 4. Now, Jesus lets us know that not only did they hate him, but because they hated him, they also hated his father. And according to Paul, this prophecy, Psalm 69, with its resulting judgment, is fulfilled in the Jews who rejected Christ as their Messiah. Now, returning back to the context in Romans, it becomes more clear to us that the elect, chosen by grace, were given the righteousness of God through faith, not works, and the rest reached, uh, reaped the due penalty of their hardness of heart. And what I find incredibly ironic is that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, spoke these words of judgment 1,000 years before his crucifixion. You know, we read that, that no prophet ever spoke of his own words, but only uh, the words of God as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, speaking through David, pronounces judgment upon those who rejected him 1,000 years before his crucifixion. Let's consider the judgment that Paul quotes from Psalm 69. Paul says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. So in the ancient Hebrew world, the table was a place of safety, a place of sustenance, a place of fellowship, a place of security. When you think about your table, I hope that when you think about your table, it is a place of safety and sustenance and fellowship and security. It ought to be, amen? The table was a place of refuge. You, you go to your table to find peace and safety from the dangers of the world and nourishment and life but David, in Psalm 69, and here Paul, in Romans 11, called for the refuge to become a snare and a trap and a retribution and a stumbling block for them. What a tragic change of fortune. You follow me? 
your table, your refuge, your place of sustenance and safety and fellowship is now turned into a trap and a snare and it is your judgment. Now what exactly Paul meant by the table is unclear. He doesn't specify, David doesn't specify, but we know that the Jews considered God's word, specifically the Torah, the first five books of the Bible or the Pentateuch, to be their source of spiritual sustenance, to be their security, to be their refuge. The Jews saw the word of God as their safety. Listen to what Jesus said to the Jews. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You think that in the scriptures you have eternal life. I, I, I believe it's a fair assessment for us to interpret their table to mean the word of God. What a shocking statement then. To consider that the word of God, we love the word of God. The word of God is, is authoritative, is inerrant, is infallible, it's a light to our path, it's a lamp to our feet. What a shocking thing then to discover that the word of God would become the trap, would become the snare, would become the stumbling block, would become the retribution. How could this be? Here's how. The more that people use scripture inappropriately, in other words, as a means of securing righteousness, with God. The more that people use scripture as a work of righteousness, think about this, a work of righteousness. What does that look like? I read in order to check the block, to say I've read today, I've, I've memorized today. How many verses have you memorized? Not, not, it's not verses, it's chapters. It's not chapters, it's books. always winning the Bible trivia, these people. You think that in them, you, you search the scriptures. That, that's a diligent thing. The Jews were, were the most diligent, at least the religious, were most diligent. You search them, you, you, you pour yourself over them, thinking that in them, you have eternal life. It's a work of righteousness. But Jesus completes the statement. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You'll pour yourself into scripture and all scripture from Genesis to Revelation, all scripture points to Jesus. They reveal to us our need for a savior. They reveal to us the plan of God for salvation. They reveal to us the fulfillment of that plan in Jesus the savior. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus on Palm Sunday. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I've spoken will judge him on the last day. The scriptures rise up. Isaiah, 
Deuteronomy. They rise up, they bear witness that those who believe the gospel, that those who obey the gospel, who follow Jesus, repent of their sin, trust in him for salvation, they bear witness that these have eternal life. And those same witnesses, the word of God, rise up and they bear witness against those who refuse to hear and to heed the word. And they will bear witness that it is these who have failed to obtain what they sought. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees over and over again, but at one point he appeals to Isaiah 6, saying to them that they had eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear because they refused to receive what was offered to them as a gift of grace. He said, you would not turn to me and live. Because they thought that in Scripture they had eternal life. I believe that's symbolic of of so much that religious people do in the vain attempt to establish their own righteousness. The things that people do to in, to, in their mind, atone for their own sin. Man, I stumbled again yesterday. I'm going to read an extra chapter today. I, I'm going to make it up. God, I'm going to make it up. I'm going to get right with you again. I'm going to give a little bit more because, you know, I, I really shouldn't have bought that thing, so I'm going to give a little bit more to make up for that. I'm going to attend two services today, just in case. The things that people will go to to establish their own righteousness rather than simply receiving the gift of grace by faith. Jesus, you've done it all for me. There's no more, no more sin, no more shame, no more guilt. Yes, we confess our sin to the Lord. We acknowledge that, that, that when we stumble, that that's wrong, it dishonors him. And then it ends there. There's no more atoning. There's no more making up for. Because our salvation is not in Scripture, our salvation is in him to whom Scripture points. And we love the word. And we're commanded to memorize the word and to teach the word and to live by the word, just not as a means of eternal life. They point us to how impossible that really is. But you see what you have to do in order to think that you find eternal life in scripture is you have to ignore the hard things. You have to ignore the things that you struggle with and focus on the things that you don't. And those become the badges and those become the virtues and those become the most important things. And that was certainly true of the Pharisees in Jesus' day. But it rebuked them saying, you refused to come to me that you might have life. What a warning to people today who are so committed to doing all the things. You know, we, we, if people 2,000 years ago could stand on the road in Jerusalem and take off their outer garment and lay it beneath the hooves of the donkey carrying Jesus 
and they could say the words, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then five days later, say, crucify him. If people 2,000 years ago could do that, is it possible that people today could gather together around a spectacle and make Jesus something that they want in their own mind? The Jews wanted a political savior. Maybe you want a marital savior. A financial savior. A depression or an anxiety savior. Is it possible that people could come today, could gather in the name of Jesus? And and they could be standing upon their own virtues and, and the word could be so central to that? You know, tell me about your walk with Christ. Tell me about your relationship with Christ. Well, I read the word every day. I memorize it. I study it. I go to 15 Bible studies a week. Do you see my highlighters? (laughs) I have some highlighters. I just don't carry them with me everywhere I go. But I ask you about your relationship with Jesus. Yeah, but I memorize the word. I love the word. The word points to Jesus. I've memorized books of the Bible. These books reveal to you Christ. They reveal to you your inadequacy. Do you love Jesus? These people know all the doctrine, they know all the trivia, but they sit down to the table of the word. I want you to close your eyes for a moment and envision, you know, David spoke in figurative language and Paul quotes it here in in Romans 11. They sit down to the table of the word of God and it's their place of safety and sustenance and security, it's their refuge. They refuse to come to Jesus by faith. They refuse to humble themselves before Jesus and say, I cannot do this. I need you, Jesus. And the word of God becomes their trap and their judgment, and their retribution. Consider the words of Hebrews 13. You can open your eyes. Consider the words of Hebrews 13, a sober warning. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. Let me pause here. The author of Hebrews understood that the gathered church could have unbelievers among them. Even people who think that they're safe. They think they're in the refuge. They think because they have fellowship in the body. They rely upon the social gathering, the fellowships, the potlucks, and we're about to have one. Uh, that's, their, that's their assurance. He says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. It's not about how you began. 
It's not about did you walk an aisle. It's not about did you pray a prayer. It's not about did you close your eyes and lift your hand when a pastor asks you to pray this prayer. It is about are you believing the gospel today? See, if, if you can fall away, you never believed it really. The, the evidence that you are saved is that today you still believe the very gospel that saved your soul. Are you still convinced that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him? That if Jesus let go, you would fall. But because Jesus refuses to let go, you will endure to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Unbelief in the wilderness. Unbelief on Palm Sunday. Is there unbelief today? Do you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? Do you want the salvation that this Jesus brought? You enter by belief. Do you already believe? Praise the Lord. Jesus said, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Whenever you find in yourself, I don't know what blessings I can count, Jesus. Lost my job, lost my dog, my truck don't work, my wife left me. I don't know what blessings I have. Do you believe the gospel? Blessed are you who see what you see. Palm Sunday was a day of tragic irony. Many people thronged to Jesus in fanfare, in celebration, in shouts of exuberance. But they would not believe his word. What began with Hosanna on Sunday ended with crucify him on Friday because of hardened hearts and blind eyes and deaf ears. Today, if you hear his word, do not harden your heart as in the day of the rebellion. Amen. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, you have blessed us to see what so many longed to see and to hear effectually the gospel of our salvation and to be given the imputed righteousness of Christ. But Lord, it's not lost on me that great crowds came around Jesus on this day of the last week of his life. And they wanted Jesus to be what they wanted him to be. And they refused to believe his word. And his word will rise up in judgment against them. I pray, Father, that today there will be soft hearts and eyes that see and ears that hear. And there will be real, genuine celebration as we sing to our King, Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. 
And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.